Carolyn Karcher is a professor emerita of English, American Studies, and Women's Studies at Temple University, where she taught for 21 years, uh, receiving awards. She is the author of numerous books. And, you know, what, what really speaks to me as I got to know her more is uh, her book, A Refugee from His Race, Elbion uh, Tourge, if I'm pronouncing that correct, and his fight against white supremacy, because it was it has similarities to the very work that Carolyn is now engaged in and I'm engaged in as Jews who um, speak out for Palestinian rights. And this is despite some really painful and sometimes and vile and, and sometimes violent uh, pushback that we get from within our own communities. And so prior to uh, writing the book that we're, or editing the book that we're going to talk about today, Reclaiming Ju uh, Judaism from Zionism, uh, Carolyn had steeped herself in that same idea of being an ally and what it really means to be in solidarity. Um, so with that, I'm proud to bring my dear friend Carolyn Karcher on the phone. Carolyn, it's so nice to see you. Oh, I, I'm ecstatic um, to be interviewed by you, and uh, it's a great honor. Thank you so much, Ariel. So I want to begin with where you came up with this idea for the book, Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism, and we'll go back in time just a little bit. So Carolyn and I, we met in 2013 on the delegation to bear witness to uh, the crime of apartheid being carried out by by our people, both Carolyn and I being Jewish. And um, it wasn't too long after that, that you started, um, unless you had thought of it before, um, started thinking about compiling this, this book. And if you could tell us um, what came behind it. Well, no, I was still actually working on the Tourget book when we went to Palestine. Um, but uh, I was feeling that I was spending more and more of my time uh, on, um, activism uh, in solidarity with Palestinians. And um, it, it just seemed as though it was more and more of a stretch to keep doing the, the kind of research and writing I had been doing. Uh, so I, I, met, I spoke to my mentor and I said, you know, can you think of a project that would help me bring my scholarly and my activist life together? And he doesn't remember having suggested this, but he did. <laughs> So um, I think he originally suggested that I write my own story, but uh, as you know, I have my own story in the book and it's it just, I could never fill a whole book with my own story, which isn't that interesting. Um, but uh, I, I met more and more people, uh, including on the 2013 uh, trip that we were both on, who underwent a similar kind of conversion experience to mine. And um, it seemed like a good idea to collect uh, these people's stories. And I was hoping that uh, a book uh, of personal accounts of what made people change their minds about Zionism and Israel would encourage others to, to do the same. Um, I, I really was, I thought of this book mainly as a book for conversations within Jewish families and communities. And um, that actually has been the hardest thing um, to get books into Jewish families and communities. Um, but, but that was my original intention was to be able to use a book, to, to write a book that could start these conversations. Could you talk a little bit about the diversity of the book from secular to religious? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, I started the book um, with uh, the voices of rabbis. And um, so the first section is called Rabbinic Voices. And I have um, several accounts, pers um, personal accounts by rabbis and starting off with Rabbi Brand Rosen, whose synagogue is the, the only one up to now to declare itself anti-Zionist, not just non-Zionist. Um, uh, after that, um, I, I have a section uh, called um, 
uh, transformative experiences in Israel, Palestine. And um, you, you, you asked about the diversity of voices. So um, to begin with, there's an age diversity. Um, some people, especially in the, um, the first, the, the um, transformative experiences section, and in a later section are like me in their 70s. And then I have a section called Voices from the Campuses where people are in their 20s. And, um, and then there are people in between. Um, I, I talked to Rebecca Vilcomerson, who was then uh, head of JVP, and she strongly advised me to make it even more diverse, to be sure to include um, uh, voices of Sephardi Mizrahi Jews uh, as well. So I have, a, I think about seven um, uh, of the contributors are Sephardi Mizrahi. And um, some of them are in the transformative experiences in Israel-Palestine section and of others in other sections. Um, uh, as you said, um, there's a range um, from uh, rabbis to uh, observant uh, Jews to completely secular Jews like myself. Thank you. So we have um, a diverse audience with us here today. Um, I think people of many faiths and ethnicities. Could you start with just telling us what is Zionism and you, wh when it began? Because I think so many of us today uh, associate Judaism with Israel kind of automatically and think that that association has, has always been there. Um, and is a natural association. So if you could give us some background, which I know you lay out in the book. Yes, definitely. Yes. Um, Zionism is in fact Jewish nationalism. And the, the Zionist movement began in the late 19th century. Um, first, there were uh, a group of Russian Jews um, who, suffering from pogroms who uh, began to have this idea of um, uh, going to uh, what they considered their ancestral land uh, to escape the pogroms. Uh, in, in fact, um, most Russian Jews uh, wanted to escape to the US. So it was a tiny minority who had this idea of, escape, of going to um, uh, Palestine. Um, th there, um, this, this uh, didn't really, this idea didn't get much traction until um, Theodore Herzl, uh, uh, a Viennese uh, and very assimilated Jew and completely secular, uh, took it up. And um, uh, he, he wrote um, uh, the, uh, the Jewish state. And um, he was the one who suggested that uh, the solution to anti-Semitism was for Jews to have a state of their own outside of Europe. He was not initially, uh, in fact, um, interested in going to Palestine. He suggested Argentina. At one point, the Zionist movement um, was interested in Uganda. Um, and these other, these alternatives really show that from the very beginning, Zionism was a settler colonial movement. Um, and, uh, there was really no consideration of the people in these areas uh, where um, the, uh, the Jews were to set up a state of their own. Um, so uh, in 1896 was when he published The Jewish State. 1897 was when he founded the uh, International um, Zionist uh, Movement, uh, which met in uh, Basel, uh, Switzerland. Um, for a long, long time, uh, Zionism was an extreme minority movement um, among Jews. Uh, religious Jews overwhelmingly rejected the idea uh, because um, according to the Torah, um, uh, the, the Messiah was supposed to um, uh, come and uh, initiate a, a peace and brotherhood among nations. And um, 
a restoration uh, to uh, the Holy Land would come within that context. Um, and they found it uh, really very impious, the idea that, um, that uh, a, a political movement would try to um, do what, the, what God was supposed to do. Um, Reform Jews were overwhelmingly against the Zionist movement um, because uh, they did not see uh, Jews as uh, an ethnic group at all. Um, they believed that Jews were citizens of the countries in which they resided and that they should be asking for equal rights within the countries where they resided. And they saw the possibility of um, uh, claiming allegiance to another state as undermining the position of Jews within their countries. And um, they, they also um, uh, quite openly rejected the, uh, the, the kinds of messianism um, that, it, that implied any kind of um, uh, eth ethnic grouping uh, of, of Jews. Um, so uh, Zionism remained a, a minority movement for a very long time. It began to get more traction uh, during World War I. Um, and uh, in part, uh, World War I did uh, usher in uh, a lot more anti-Semitism um, anti uh, in various parts of Europe and also in the US. Um, but it, it was especially the rise of Nazism that gave traction to the idea of the Zionists. Um, the vast majority of the founders of Zionism were completely secular, uh, including, for instance, uh, Ben-Gurion. Uh, they were secular, they were even atheists. Um, and uh, this was one of the reasons why religious Jews opposed the Zionist movement. Um, so uh, it's really that the turning point um, is really um, just before and during World War II. Um, I would say that another contributing factor to um, how, why Zionism triumphed and why um, uh, they were able to uh, convince um, the US and other countries to support the founding of a Jewish state in Palestine um, is that uh, the US in particular, but other countries as well, didn't particularly want to welcome um, refugees. And um, 19, in 1924, the US had, uh, had um, uh, passed this extreme anti-immigrant uh, law, um, which limited the number of um, immigrants from uh, parts of Europe that were not um, Nordic and, and white. <laughs> um, uh, and so um, uh, they, uh, the US was very much, I mean, although uh, President Roosevelt and President Truman tried in fact to increase the number of refugees that the US would um, admit, the Congress was very much uh, hostile to the idea. So, um, it was not just the Zionist movement, but also um, uh, its supporters in Europe and, and the US, uh, its non-Jewish so political supporters in Europe and the US who um, tried to solve the, the problem of pers Jewish persecution on the backs of the Palestinian people. So we are right at the time of year when we commemorate um, the Nakba, which means catastrophe. And you you just said um, about uh, being on the backs of the Palestinian people. Uh, would you give us an idea uh, for anybody who's not familiar with uh, the Nakba, what happened with when the Jewish state was founded? When, when you read about it or you see films, it's so heartbreaking. And if you try to imagine yourself in, um, in those circumstances, um, I don't see how you can not have your heart broken. But um, actually beginning before 
uh, Israel declared itself a state. Beginning already in 1947, uh, Zionist militias were um, going around uh, um, chasing Palestinians out of their villages and out of uh, the uh, neighborhoods, of the cities where they were the vast majority. Um, people, I mean, from really one day to the next, um, had found that, that for the sake of uh, ensuring their, their safety and the safety of their children, they just had to pick up and leave um, with the keys to their house, uh, houses in their pockets, thinking that they would be back after the end of hostilities, but um, not able to take um, their possessions with them. And when they did take their pos possessions with them, they were often uh, robbed, you know, by the uh, the Jewish militias um, who were uh, driving them out and who were um, uh, directing them uh, uh, out, um, directing them towards um, other countries or other other parts of um, Palestine. So um, before. Uh, actually, before May 15th, when Israel declared its independence, already 250,000 Palestinians had been driven out. Um, uh, be between um, uh, 48 and 49, when the armistice was, uh, was declared, um, a total of uh, some say 750,000, some say 800,000, some say more Palestinians were driven out of uh, the country. And this represented one half of the um, population of Palestine. And um, if, you know, if we try to imagine the US, I mean, imagine one half of the population of the US. Um, uh, try to imagine whole neighborhoods of your own cities um, being just emptied out um, at the point of a gun. Um, it's it's really heartbreaking, and um, we've uh, in in our um, JVPDC Metro chapter we've been doing a lot of reading of um, Palestinian narratives, and um, uh, a couple of the members of our group are also Palestinian, and it's clear that um, this this sense of of uh, having been cut off from your, your roots, your place, um, that this was a terribly traumatic experience um, that affected people for, you know, more than one generation. And um, the people who experienced it, even when they lead fairly comfortable lives now here in the US, uh, really never gotten over the trauma of being driven out. So, um, that's what that's what the, the Nakba means, but it means also uh, the you know, many many of the people who were driven out were wealthy, and um, they they were uh, they were reduced to utter destitution. Um, they had to start all over again, and some never succeeded in starting over again. Many never succeeded. So um, one one has to really uh, try to imagine what it would have been like if any of us had been in that position and uh, had been driven out and uh, never never allowed to return home even after the end of hostilities. Um, I think uh, many people know that the UN passed a res resolution, Resolution 194, which in fact, President Truman was in favor of, saying that the refugees should be allowed home um, after the cessation of hostilities, as, as long as they would um, agree to uh, to live in peace with their Jewish neighbors. Um, Israel was absolutely against that um, and uh, never never considered it. And so that's that's what the situation is now. You have um, now some millions of refugees, I think more than four million, five million of uh, Maybe uh, Ariel, you have a uh, figure in your head. Um, Don't just... be sure that one of our participants, 
does. I know Dr. Zogby is on. Uh, Alex McDonald is on. So I, so I imagine one of our participants can, can put that in the yeah. chat. But it's millions and millions of, of people who uh, ought to, be, to have the right to return home and do not. Yeah, so I want to ask if you can talk a bit about what, you know, so it, it became that Zionism was the norm throughout the U.S. And if we go to synagogues today, most of them have the Israeli flag on one side and the American flag on the other side. So it, that came to be the case. But I know that, um, though not in my family, there was still uh, opposition to this, you know, early on. And and I wonder if you can talk a bit about that and as well as tell us your story, which I find touching and <laughs> moving. Yes, my, um, I have not done enough research uh, on this, but from everything that I've read so far, my sense is that it's really after 1967 that um, that Israel and Zionism uh, become anchored in um, the, in Jewish synagogues and Jewish uh, religious practice. Um, by you know by the time after World War II, uh, by the time Israel was established, the majority of the Jewish community was in favor of it. Um, I, I do want to talk about the groups that opposed it and and fought it and worked very hard against it and lost the battle. But um, the majority of the Jewish community were in favor. Uh, but that didn't yet mean that Israel was part of, um, of Jewish practice or Judaism. Um, it didn't yet mean that, um, that it was even part of Jewish identity. Uh, I believe that really doesn't begin to happen until after the 67 war and um, the uh, Israeli triumph in that war, which um, awakened a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in people and um, made people really identify with what we now see as a very militaristic Israel. Um, so if to backtrack a little bit and to talk about the opponents. So um, uh, I mentioned that the reform um, movement had been very much against Zionism and uh, it, it begins to really shift um, during World War II. Um, and while this shift was going on, uh, um, a group uh, of rabbis uh, founded the American Council for Judaism. And uh, this group tried desperately to prevent the creation of Israel. Um, they warned uh, of the um, they, they warned of the militarism to come. They warned of the hostility uh, towards um, Palestinians and the hostility between uh, Jewish Israelis and the entire um, Arab Muslim world. Um, if, uh, if Israel was founded. Um, they uh, were unable to really get much traction in the Jewish community. They sought allies in the State Department, the War Department, um, and uh, even, even higher up, um, but they failed. Uh, the other group that was um, also uh, anti-Zionist was um, uh, a group of East Euro I mean, I forgot to mention that the American Council for Judaism was it was uh, overwhelmingly uh, German um, uh, German descended Jews who were much more integrated um, into the U.S. and quite prosperous. Um, the other group was a group called the Bund, um, and these uh, people um, uh, were um, Jewish. Uh, uh, East European Jewish immigrants, um, a lot of Russian Jewish immigrants, um, many of whom were completely secular and um, were very, uh, they, were, they were socialists, they were committed to fighting for labor rights, um, and they uh, had a very powerful movement in Eastern Europe, which of course was completely decimated 
uh, in the Holocaust. Um, uh, but some of them succeeded in escaping and um, came to, to New York and um, regrouped and re, uh, reorganized themselves. But by that time, um, the, uh, the Jewish sentiment was really so much against them that even though um, they uh, continually uh, advocated against the founding of a Jewish state, um, issued the same kinds of warnings that the American Council for Judaism did, uh, called for solidarity between Jews and uh, Palestinians. Again, um, they were really, uh, they, they were treated pretty much like anti-Zionists are treated nowadays. Um, they, they were vilified, um, uh, demonized, um, uh, ostracized, and so they were also unable to, um, to stop the creation of the Jewish state. Um, so you asked me about my background. Yes. Um, yes. So um, I grew up actually in Tokyo, in Japan. Um, my, uh, my grandfather uh, had a, a fishery business in Siberia, which had branches in Japan. And... Um, after the Soviets uh, came to power um, and they, um, they confiscated the uh, fishery as they did all, um, uh, all capitalist property, uh, but eventually asked him uh, during the, the period uh, called new economic policy, NYEP, um, to continue to run the fishery for them since they didn't have cadres who really were, were good at capitalism at that point. Um, but, but my, my grandfather transferred most of the business to Japan and moved the family to Japan. Um, some, uh, some of the members of the family uh, who lived in uh, a, a, a town in Siberia called Nikolaevsk on the Amur were actually uh, uh, murdered by partisans um, during the civil war between um, uh, Soviets and, um, and white Russians um, who represented the czar. Um, uh, Anyway, um, the surviving family members and my grandfather and his children were um, sent to Japan. So um, uh, my, my father, uh, his elder brother, his younger sister, all three of them went to school in Japan. And eventually um, my, grand, my grandfather had visited the US uh, during the Russo-Japanese War and was very impressed with the US and decided he wanted his children to become Americans. So he sent one child after the other to University of California, Berkeley to, um, to, uh, to study and um, eventually to get US citizenship. Um, so uh, my father worked for a time um, in my grandfather's business, but the business collapsed during the thirties like so many other businesses. And um, because my father uh, knew was familiar with the Far East and knew Japanese and uh, some Chinese, uh, Mandarin. Um, uh, he was offered um, a job, uh, uh, I think it was by um, Universal uh, Pictures, um, selling um, American films to uh, Chinese, Indian, and other, um, other chi uh, China, India, and other countries. And that's what he did. And uh, during World War II, he um, joined the army, although he was way over age. He was completely devoted to this country. And uh, it wasn't good enough for him to, um, to uh, not fight for the country, even though uh, he was actually sent to the Pentagon along with virtually everybody who had grown up in Japan uh, to be used um, in the, the fight against the Japanese. Um, that wasn't good enough for him. He wanted to be in combat, which he became and um, then uh, had to leave after getting malaria and hepatitis. Um, so uh, he went back into the film industry in Singapore where um, I spent the first few years of my life after being born in Washington, DC um, during my father's recuperation from um, malaria and hepatitis. And um, he lost his job there after several years and the family um, on their way to the US to get another job stopped in Japan to say goodbye to my grandfather and they never left. So, um, so my parents uh, stayed in Japan for 28 years. 
I stayed in Japan from age five until age 17, going to the American school in Japan, and um, which was founded by Protestant missionaries in 1903. Uh, and um, uh, I came to go to college in 1962. Um, and uh, for me, um, the US was a foreign country when I arrived here. <laughs> Um, so you want me to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the community I grew up in in Japan. So um, there, it was a very small synagogue, um, a, a Jewish community center with a synagogue. Uh, I, I can't remember the number of families, um, but I would say a small number of families. I would say maybe 100 people rather than 100 families. At, at maximum. It was a very small synagogue. Um, and uh, the, um, the vast majority of the members were uh, Siberian Jews, like my father's family. Um, there was also another contingent of Jews who were Sephardi. Um, we called them Sephardi, um, uh, who uh, were born in Sir Syria or Lebanon, and uh, in one case, Egypt, although I, I didn't know it at the time. And um, uh, they were all French speaking and had gone to schools um, by uh, the um, Alliance, um, uh, I forget what it was called, but these were uh, schools run uh, by um, actually Ashkenazi Zionists in, uh, in the French colonies. And um, so that was another big group. Um, and uh, my classmates, I would say that um, we would be maybe five Jewish kids in a class of about 30. And um, if I try to remember who my classmates were, um, I can think of maybe two who were Ashkenazi. Uh, one, I didn't even know she was Jewish. She never mentioned it. Um, and um, uh, maybe three who were Sephardi. And we didn't really make a distinction because as I said, the synagogue was very small and uh, Jews were so much a minority. Um, the, uh, there were a few Orthodox families in the community, and they were the ones who couldn't compromise. And so the, the synagogue was essentially an Orthodox synagogue, except that uh, men and women didn't sit separately. Um, and uh, the, uh, the synagogue um, ran a, a, a cemetery uh, for foreigners in Yokohama, um, which is about an, out, an hour outside of Tokyo by train. And um, my grandfather, my grandmother, um, and uh, an uncle and aunt are all buried there. Um, there's, there are a lot of Jewish families buried in, in that cemetery. Um, so uh, the uh, the synagogue was much more diverse than, than American synagogues are today. Um, and I never had the experience that so many American Jews have of growing up in a Jewish community. Um, first of all, we were a, a small minority of foreigners in Japan. And secondly, we were an even smaller minority of Jews in the foreign community in, 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 uh, in Tokyo and in my high school. Um, but um, Everybody was united on Zionism. Uh, I, um, the um, thing I remember best was, uh, well, I have two, two memories. Um, we, uh, we of course went to Hebrew school on, on Sundays and our Hebrew school teacher was not a rabbi. She was an Israeli woman from the embassy. And what did we read for Hebrew school? Not the Torah, not the Talmud, no. Leon Uris is Exodus. So I, I was very brainwashed um, into Zionism um, that way. And, um, but the other memory is that in 1956, when uh, Israel, France, and Britain um, tried to uh, take back the, the Suez Canal and invade Egypt and basically uh, uh, over, overthrow Nasser, um, uh, we were all very, very proud of Israel's performance in that war. And we were furious with Eisenhower for insisting that they, um, they pull out. Um, so uh, that gives you a sense of the, the community's um, Zionist feelings. I mean, everybody was pro-Israel. Uh, and um, 
So I, I, I also had a cousin who grew up there. Yes. So when did that change for you? And what was the climate like at the time? Uh, we see now a growing, growing movement of anti-Zionists, especially among young Jews. Uh, but what was the experience like for you to, to reach that point? Yes, well, um, I certainly didn't reach it um, leaving Japan and entering college. I, I never joined Hillel or anything. I, um, I, uh, I felt like a part of the Jewish community in Tokyo, but I didn't particularly want to start a Jewish community at Stanford in, in California. So nothing changed for me, except that I continued to have the same ideas. Um, what happened was that um, uh, in 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon. And um, I, uh, I was actually in France with my husband um, during the uh, part of the invasion. And um, there was much more coverage of the invasion in France than there was in the US. Although looking back, it seems that there was quite a lot of coverage in the US, much more than there would be for many decades after that. Um, my husband, who was working with the World Bank and who was not Jewish, uh, although he discovered recently through uh, DNA that he's one quarter Jewish. <laughs> um, uh, fortunately, his father never knew he was half Jewish or the family would have ended up in the camps um, during World War, uh, World War II. In any case, my, my husband's job at the World Bank uh, entailed uh, travel to a lot of countries and uh, Lebanon was one of them. And um, he you know, found Beirut a beautiful city. Um, he had uh, also a Lebanese secretary um, that uh, he was on very good terms with. And um, so when the Israeli invasion of Lebanon started, it wasn't like it was on another planet for him. This was a place that he knew very well and had um, good colleagues in, and he was horrified and shocked by it. And so this um, encouraged me to pay more attention to it too. Um, so this, uh, this really cracks my image of Israel. Um, it, it seemed like an aggressive war. Uh, it um, clearly, I mean, Israel was doing all the things it has always done, although I didn't know that it had always done these things. Um, uh, bombing uh, civilians, um, rounding up uh, large numbers of men and throwing them into prisons, um, executing uh, prisoners and so forth. Um, this was just not the Israel that uh, I had been uh, taught to believe in. Um, so when I got back to the US, I remember, first of all, I was uh, on a study leave then, which meant that I actually had some time to think and to do things um, instead of spending, you know, all my waking hours and some of my sleeping hours um, preparing to teach. But um, I was walking down the street and I saw a poster for a teach-in um, on uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. And so I went to it and uh, the speaker, the, the main speaker that they had um, said things that just set my stomach churning. I absolutely, I, I tried to shut her out. I just couldn't listen to her. Um, she, uh, she said, you, you've all, you know, been taught about um, Israel turning, uh, making the desert bloom. You never, you never are told about the destructive side of Israel. Um, she, she told us about home demolitions, about the uprooting of olive trees, and things like that. She also talked about the settlers. Uh, this was back in 82. So there were very few settlers at the time. Um, they came from the uh, US, from Brooklyn. Um, and um, she said, why can't you keep your crazies at home? <laughs> and she, um, she talked about their violence and the way they tried to provoke um, uh, co conflict with the Palestinians. Um, after she was done, I learned that her name was Leah Tsemo and that she was a very well-known Israeli human rights lawyer, Israeli Jewish human rights lawyer. 
And realizing that she was Israeli Jewish and not Palestinian, as I had assumed when I heard her say all these things, I, I was able to open my mind and listen to her. So I stopped um, by the literature table and picked up a bunch of books and pamphlets and started reading. So that was the beginning uh, of my rethinking. Um, I think the, the following year, maybe I went to another demonstration where I heard another Israeli speaker uh, named Israel Shahak, um, uh, who said very similar things to what uh, Leah Temel had said. Um, and then um, the, the books that I was reading, um, some, of, some of them by anti-Zionist Jews who uh, of course were completely vilified and ostracized and uh, written out of history, um, explained some of the background of this. And that, so I don't remember how long it took me. And I, I know it wasn't a linear process. I mean, for instance, when uh, the idea of uh, two states was launched, um, I, I thought it was a good idea and I embraced it. Uh, so I, I kind of went back and forth on this. But um, de definitely my disenchantment with Israel dated from the, um, the, the war in Lebanon. So I wanna ask you kind of two questions combined because I know we're um, reaching the top of the hour and if folks are all right, I think we'll go um, 10 or so minutes longer, if that's all right. Uh, but I want to ask you both about your your engagement in Jewish Voice for Peace and your work as, as part of that organization, um, and as well, how you've seen the anti-Zionist movement uh, grow over recent years. Yes, well, um, I first heard about Jewish Voice for Peace through an ad in The Nation. <laughs> and um, this, uh, this ad was signed by people like Adrian Rich and uh, Howard Zinn. So how could you not be impressed by that? Um, but it was still a national organization. And um, uh, our, our local DC Metro chapter was founded in December, 2010. Um, our chapter is, is different from uh, many others. I mean, some are purely Jewish chapters from what I understand. Um, ours is about 50-50 and has Palestinian members. At one point it had uh, Leban Lebanese members, um, one of whom is still uh, in the chapter, but she doesn't come to very many meetings, but you know, she still considers herself one of us. Um, many uh, Christians. Um, so, um, we we started uh, with there was um, there were demonstrations against SodaStream, um, which uh, at that time was uh, built in a settlement um, uh, um, a settlement called Maale Ma Adumim, and um, we we recruited a lot of people that way through demonstrations uh, against SodaStream. Um, we haven't had a good target for a long time. Um, but we, we do a, a lot of demonstrations. We've put on a lot of, um, one of our members, for instance, wrote a play called It's What We Do, uh, based on the testimonies of um, Israeli soldiers in Breaking the Silence. That was very successful. Um, we, uh, we invite speakers, um, we show films, um, that kind of thing. Uh, and we were a presence, very much of a presence in uh, this week's uh, this Sunday's Nakba um, commemorations. Um, we, we did feel like a very small group of anti-Zionists. Clearly young people are joining uh, who are um, already anti-Zionists and there are many, many more of them than there were in my day. I mean, between 1982 and 2010, I really had nobody to identify with. Um, I was very busy with teaching. So if not, I might have tried to join a uh, new Jewish agenda or something like that. But um, the, uh, you, you just were so marginalized in the beginning. And now, in fact, there's a place for people to come. And there's also this uh, young Jewish uh, movement. Um, uh, I'm having a senior moment. Help me with- If not now. Uh, if not now, right. <laughs> Um, right. So um, 
none of that existed. Uh, I think if not now, it was founded in 2014. So speaking of young Jews and young Jewish movement, I, I want to let folks know that um, the reason for the timing of uh, having Carolyn on as our guest this month is because uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, we have a fellowship to support young emerging faith leaders. And towards the end of this month, we will, or beginning of next month, we will shortly be welcoming our 2023-2024 fellow, and everyone will get announcements about this. And she is a young Asian American, anti, proudly anti-Zionist rabbi uh, to be ordained this month. And, and we're really excited to, to get to work with her. And, um, you know, as you were talking about, Carolyn, the, the Jewish youth is really shifting, Jewish American youth, I should say, is really shifting the conversation and providing, I think, a lot of hope and excitement for those of us who have been in this for a while, you much longer than me, um, uh, and, and witnessing things getting worse and worse on the ground. So I have a couple of questions from folks. Um, would you say that the policies of Israel uh, have it contributed to anti-Semitism and how? And would you also describe uh, the vision for the future that anti-Zionists, that the anti-Zionist movement has? Thank you. Um, I, I would like to add to that question by saying that, in fact, um, Israel has been doing us a huge favor. Um, that it's, it's <laughs> thanks to Israel's um, having uh, dropped the mask and um, having shown their true face that we are getting so many more people willing to question what has been the dominant narrative for so long. Um, I, I do feel that uh, Israel is surely contributing to anti-Semitism, but I, I can't point to examples of it. I mean, how when they claim to be speaking for the Jews, and they they seem and uh, when the Jewish community keeps um, acting as though anti-Semitism is the only form of racism that counts. Um, and is more uh, that we're we're suffering more than African Americans or uh, or um, Indigenous Americans or Latinos um, that our oppression is worse than everybody else's oppression. It seems to me that that's got to contribute to uh, resentment against Jews, which could at some point turn into anti-Semitism. Um, so a country that claims to be speaking for Jews and that is committing atrocities um, and uh, behaving so cruelly toward Palestinians, how can that not, in the end, um, create anti-Semitism? Um, the, the main source of anti-Semitism in the US right now is, of course, um, the white nationalism in, uh, in the but these people actually admire Israel. And what they admire is the idea of an ethnic state. I mean, for them, Israel is a model of what they would like the US to be. So um, it's, a, it's a weird kind of anti Semitism. <laughs> um, and um, I can't really uh, talk very much about um, how, how it plays out since I don't know these people. Um, I think I've lost part of the question you wanted me to. Sure. What would you just, how would you describe the anti oh, the vision of the future. Movement, right. the vision for the yes. future. Yes. Um, I think that more and more people realize that um, just as we want the US to be a country where everybody has equal rights and everybody has an equal right to flourish, to uh, maintain or not maintain uh, their culture as they choose, um, that uh, why should Israel be any different? Um, why should we not want for Israel what we want for our own country? 
I think, um, you know, a lot of Palestinians talk about the fact <clears throat> that um, Israel has to be decolonized. And <clears throat> I was reading an article by um, my favorite Israeli historian, Ilan Pape, last night, who talked about the need for reparations. So um, these things clearly um, can't be, you, you can't just create a state where everybody on paper is equal and not, um, not look at all of the harm that has been done and try to redress it in some way. Um, one of the um, Palestinian activists whom you and I both know very well, <laughs> uh, Isa Amro, says it's really premature to talk about a vision for the future. Um, you know, that for, for him, it's working to end the occupation that should be the first priority. Uh, so there, there are different answers to this question, but I think um, those are the answers that I've heard in, from different people. And um, I wanna invite folks if they have questions to put them in the chat. And as we start to move towards winding up, I wanna encourage folks to pick up the book. It's available at the OR bookstore, Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism. And just to give us um, a little more, a little, another little sort of taste from the book, you could um, tell us about one of the contributors that spoke to you, you know, that whose story spoke to you um, specifically. I mean, I, I know all of them did, but um, <clears throat> one of the less usual, uh, uh, less the more unusual uh, stories of transformation. Well, I don't know if this is an unusual one, but. Alice Rothschild's contribution. Sorry about this. No problem. Um, Alice Rothschild's contribution is really outstanding, and she's a wonderful writer. And she was one of the presenters at the um, the uh, event that you missed, unfortunately, because of your car, uh, a couple of Sundays ago. Um, and uh, her story uh, talks about. Um, again, growing up in a very Zionist family, um, and, uh, and then her, her activism in left movements and how um, little by little, um, she uh, began to see um, how contrary uh, left values were uh, uh, to her, um, her ideas about Israel and Palestine, and also the hatred of Arabs that she had grown up with, uh, which many of us grew up with, you know, as if, uh, I mean, Nazis were transferred to Arabs. Um, uh, and so that, that would be one of them. I, another, I mean, the one that would be perhaps most unusual um, would be one of the um, uh, Sephardi Mizrahi contributors <clears throat> who uh, teaches at a university uh, in the Boston area, who is of, of Yemeni background and um, who grew up in Israel and uh, of course grew up as an ardent Zionist. And for her, <coughs> the beginning of her story was um, learning the story of uh, Yemeni uh, children stolen from their parents and um, given, uh, I mean, they were, they were told that their child had died, but in fact, uh, research later showed that some of them had been given to Ashkenazi uh, childless couples and or even sold to American childless couples. So uh, for her, um, that, that was a very key experience. Um, I guess uh, those are two. <clears throat> Yeah, so we have a question that that uh, I don't know if you can answer, uh, but I know you did. We did have some success recently at getting into a synagogue, uh, but how can um, we Americans? Uh, oh, sorry, there's two questions, and I'm going to combine them. How can we get these conversations into Jewish communities and 
challenge organizations like the Anti-Defamation League or the American Jewish Committee, who both of whom who unapologetically uh, support uh, Israel and continued violations of Palestinian rights. And then the second question is how we can counter the conflation of anti-Zionism uh, with anti-Semitism. Those are two great questions. And those are um, two of the things that uh, actually uh, JDP has been working on for a long time. Uh, I'll begin with the, the second one. Um, what's, uh, what is encouraging about uh, challenging the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IHRA definition that equates anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism is that uh, some of the liberal Zionist organizations are collaborating with us on that. Um, I believe J Street, um, uh, Americans for Peace Now, um, at, uh, at least those two groups. Um, and I think there are others who do see um, how dangerous that is for free speech and um, just uh, how, how counterproductive it is in the fight against anti anti-Semitism. Um, so I think there's hope on, on that front. Um, getting into synagogues, that's the million dollar question. Um, we were very fortunate because the, the synagogue that uh, I was able to um, uh, present in with what were supposed to be five contributors, it turned out to be four because Ariel at the last minute couldn't make it. Um, is, uh, it's a synagogue in Oakland called Kahila, <clears throat> which has always prided itself on being one of the most progressive synagogues in the country. I tried to get into that synagogue in 2019 when the book came out and uh, um, a member of their Middle East committee was very enthusiastic about the, the program and um, it got nixed by uh, other people on the committee, including a rabbi. Um, and um, this time, uh, Seth Morrison, who used to be a member of our DC Metro chapter, and then um, moved to San, um, uh, moved to Las Vegas, and, and ultimately to Berkeley, uh, and is now a member of Kahila, and joined all their Middle East committees. So he was able to, to do it. But interestingly, people remembered that they had uh, refused to allow it in 2019 and said, um, people have moved on. Um, people have changed their minds. So, um, you know, I do think what Israel is doing is creating, you know, some, um, some space uh, for getting into synagogues now that wouldn't have been there before. Um, I heard of a conservative rabbi <clears throat> who's supposed to speak, I think, on Peter Beinart's program this coming Friday, who uh, will, will no longer recite the prayer for Israel um, uh, in his Shabbat service. And, um, you know, I think that we can speak to people like that and try to get their synagogues to invite us. And I, I'm working on, you know, trying again at all these places that refused me before, and also uh, playing the recording the, of our session at Kahila. Um, uh, I mean, sending them a link to the recording because what's interesting is it was a totally positive experience. It was totally friendly. There wasn't a single hostile question. And I know one of the reasons that people have refused is they, they don't want to, quote, split the synagogue. And there didn't seem to be anything to split. People really were interested. And one of the members of the synagogue wrote to Seth and said, we're hungry to be able to discuss this issue. I should say that my my cousins are members of Kihila Synagogue. And uh, I want to let folks know because we've been getting a lot of questions in the chat about the recording of this conversation. And yes, it is being uh, recorded and it will go up on YouTube and we will send it out to everybody who registered uh, for this event, as well as the recording from Kahila Synagogue, which includes a panel of contributors to the book. As Carolyn said, I was scheduled to be a panelist on that, but uh, my daughter and I had our car break down in the midst of it. And um, I am hoping to have next opportunities because I hope for this conversation to take place in synagogues. Uh, and I invite um, uh, folks who are 
uh, who are on this on this con part of this conversation, if you belong to a synagogue or you belong to a different faith organization and you would like to host an event of contributors to the book Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism to have this conversation, you can reach out to me and that's Ariel Gold at FOR or to Ethan, uh, organizing at forusa.org. Um, and we will put you in touch uh, with Carolyn. And um, as we get ready to close out, I want to uh, thank you, Carolyn, for all of your work on this issue, for all that you meant to, to me. Um, you know, I, I invite folks to read my contribution to the book, but uh, just to give a little heads up, I, I was already um, a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, and I was already um committed to to uh the boycott movement of israel of boycotting israel for palestinian rights and yet it wasn't until i put my feet on the ground in occupied land that um in there that that i could really imagine the the horror and I spent the time there, much of the time there crying. So I'm on Carolyn and Martin's shoulder and I recognized it later as grief and um, that I had allowed myself to, to grieve um, this, this, this image uh, of a country for Jews only and, while, and realizing the, the dark, dark reality of that place and uh, watching children be detained and watching um, children be shot at with tear gas and hearing stories about home demolitions. And, and, and I could go on and on, but um, personal transformation is, is something that um, Fellowship of Reconciliation has uh, long been committed to. And we are, are our flagship campaign right now, Fellowship of Reconciliations, is to reclaim the name of God. And in particular, uh, in that case, to confront Christian nationalism as the um, as, as the main you know, issue here in the U.S., which is, of course, tied to Zionism, to Jewish supremacy. And so what we are looking for when we talk about reclaiming the name of God is we are talking about that personal transformation of committing ourselves to uh, building a better world, to being in solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters, with our indigenous brothers and sisters, and knowing that even that even when that solidarity is painful, even when it involves grief, um, that that's work that we are committed to. So, Carolyn, I wanted to give you the last word, and um, if you have any uh, thoughts to leave uh, our audience with, I, I, I guess <clears throat> the last word really is that we all need to listen to Palestinians. It's it's until it's not until you really talk to them, listen to their stories, that you understand on a visceral level what this is all about and that your solidarity becomes not theoretical, but, but real. And Carolyn, I hope you will join us when uh, not too long from now, we officially welcome Rabbi Mayi to uh, be our 2023-2024 fellow. Absolutely. I remember her well, and I'm very excited about this. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank, thank you for the questions, everybody in the audience.